how close exactly are we to a kind of World War Three scenario playing out here? Because we've seen Russia doing tactical nuclear drills. We've seen, I have reported here about, you know, a certain Russian think tanks and policy strategists talk about what would it mean to uh, test out a nuclear, a nuclear weapon, a strategic nuclear weapon to show that they have them and they exist. Uh, maybe uh, put a mushroom cloud uh, up somewhere far, <laughs> far away for the United States and NATO to view and get onto camera so they have confirmation that these weapons exist in Russia's arsenal. How close are we then to this kind of uh, doomsday scenario? Because it seems like I've been I've been saying on this channel that it it feels like while the United States and NATO are not necessarily rushing, they're putting in the foundation. Those are all good points, and I worry about each of them uh, almost on a daily basis. I I know, although I can't I can't ferret out the actual specifics that we're talking right now. And I'm, I'm being told that we're talking mostly about prisoner exchanges. And when I say talking, we've got people who really know how to do diplomacy, like Bill Burns involved. Um, and we've got the good offices of Oman and other places that want to see this stop. So if that is serious talking and it expands into talk about a ceasefire and ultimately a conclusion to this conflict, that's good. And that's my most ardent wish. But at the same time, I have to say I don't expect that because I've seen nothing out of this administration but idiocy. Um, and what you're talking about with regard to nuclear weapons could come about even if what I said preliminarily is true, that we are talking and that we might finally achieve something that would lead to real talks. You're looking at a situation where a lot of things have happened in the last 30 years in particular. And boy, have I noticed this because I'm 80 and I grew up during the Cold War. I grew up when Lyndon Johnson put out a pamphlet, for example, that I used to share with my George Washington University and my, my William and Mary students who were shocked. The pamphlet told you how to build a bomb shelter in your backyard. It was an official government pamphlet. And it told you how to stock it, how to put the right water amount in there, how to put food in there, the survival food. You it was all about people understanding, at least, at least intuitively, if not intellectually, that you could disappear. Uh, a mushroom cloud or two or three or a hundred might show up at any moment and your life would be over and all your neighbors' lives would be over. Your state would be wiped out and maybe your country. Now, you'd wipe the other side out, too, because it would be a general strategic exchange of 30,000 warheads on both sides. But they understood this. And that's gone. Totally gone. Not only is it totally gone, not only do the American people not even think about this sort of prospect anymore, we have ourselves, Washington, destroyed every single treaty regime and environment that we built up during that very dangerous, precarious twilight struggle we call the Cold War, the Cold War. We've done it. We did it. My president, George W. Bush, the one that appointed me and put me in my position at the State Department, he abrogated the ABM treaty without so much as a fairly well to the Russians. My boss, Colin Powell, had to get on a plane and rush off. I've got to do something here. I can't believe the president did this. Abrogated that treaty with no other reason than his secretary of defense and his vice president wanted to build ballistic missile defense, which came to be a real threat to Putin when we started talking about essentially putting it in Ukraine when it became a member of NATO, or maybe even before that. So Putin had ample reason to do what he did in Ukraine. I'm not condoning it but he had ample reason to do it. We didn't have any reason to invade Iraq in 2003, but we did it. So if anyone should be excoriated for an aggressive war that didn't need to be, it should be the United States. We're the biggest hypocrites in the world. Back to the point though, this dangerous situation where the American people, and I do suspect the Russian people too, I don't know this for a fact, but I suspect they've lost a lot of this Cold War angst and fear, too, because generations have 
replace generations. There's no fear in the land about nuclear war. There's no treaties. So everyone's fat, dumb, and happy. In America, we have no skin in the game whatsoever. Less than 1% of Americans serve in the military and have their lives threatened and go in harm's way. 99% are fat, dumb, and happy and love it that way. Love it that way, which is despicable in a democracy. Think of Rome, who turned its entire security over right before the end to foreigners. No Roman citizen wanted to serve in the legions, so they had to turn their security over to foreigners. That's what we're winding up doing, we're turning it over to the poorest people in the land and an all volunteer force that can't even recruit now. They've been short for two years in a row. We can't sail ships. We can't man battalions. We can't do almost anything with our army reserve because they're so short people. Um, so this is a this is just a preposterous situation. And I say all that latter because guess who's going to be the first to use nuclear weapons in this treaty list? forgotten them environment, America. We're going to be the first ones because we're going to get in a real peer power war, whether it's with Moscow over the circumstances you just described, or it's with Beijing over Taiwan or the South China Sea or whatever. Won't make any difference. We're going to lose in the opening shots. And the American people are going to be so shocked. They have never in their life seen Think about this. In their life, even if they're 50, 60 years old, they have never seen the casualties that are going to come in the first 24 to 36 hours and then every day thereafter if we get in a pure power conflict. They've never seen it. More, they have never, you say World War II, Korea. Well, that was over there. That was over there. Maybe the list came to the New York Times, but this is going to be wholesale and within 24 to 36 hours and repetitive over the first six or seven weeks until there's nothing left. Guess who's going to go nuclear in those circumstances? We'll have two choices. We will surrender. And I don't think any White House is going to do that. I, I do think the majority of the American people will probably be for a surrender. But I don't think the White House is going to go for that. Any, any party. Republican, Democrat, independent order in possession of power in this country today, in this empire today, is never going to let the empire succumb. So we're going to go nuclear. That's our trump card. We will be the first users of nuclear weapons if we allow this situation that exists right now to go on. So I'm as scared about us doing that in a peer power conflict that goes very badly for us in the opening 30 days, which any peer power conflict will given the state of our armed forces. And I'm also frightened about what might happen in Ukraine because it could be the linchpin of the wooden-headed thinking, if you will, that would lead to an exchange. Because again, if Putin just demonstrates, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to demonstrate too. Where are we going to demonstrate? We're going to demonstrate in the air and, and burst the last or break the last treaty. As I understand it, Putin has said he doesn't believe in the CTBT anymore anyway, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Um, so you're right. Both scenarios, we get we walk ourselves stupidly into a peer power war, either with Moscow and China or China and Moscow, because let's face it, we go to Moscow, China's going to be on their side. We go to China, Moscow's going to be on their side. We either walk into that one and have to use it first to prevent a colossal defeat, or we walk into it in Ukraine through just blind stupidity. So it's a very dangerous moment for the world. Um, there are, and we've forgotten this, we have totally forgotten this. I went through it when we were destroying Russian warheads so fast that the lawyers got involved with liability issues and stopped us from doing it. At the end of the Cold War, we were destroying 30,000 warheads in the Soviet Union. And we got down to four, five, six thousand maybe before we were stopped and before everything went, went to hell and we couldn't do it anymore. And we did the same thing on our own. So we went from 30 on both, roughly 30,000 on both sides down to around five to six on both sides, which is a monumental achievement, but not enough. Now, let me give you my point. There's enough megatonnage on our submarines and on Russian submarines alone. Either side fires all of them or most of them to destroy the world. Destroy the world. There'd be no planet left that humans could live on. There's some question about whether the planet itself would survive, but I think it would. But human life would not survive. 
We don't need the climate crisis. We don't need climate change. We would destroy the world. Um, that's just on the submarines. How many Americans know that? Uh, you go into the street, not a, you couldn't find a one who could tell you that. Not a one. And then what would they say if, if, if you told them? First of all, they wouldn't believe you. They'd think you were a member of the Trump cult or you know some other crazy group. And even if they did believe you, it would be hard for them to, to even conjure what that means. And yet, these ballistic missile submarines carry death for the world. Yeah, and I, it, might, it might be good to talk uh, more about China. You know, I've uh, been very interested in speaking to you about China ever since you uh, spoke to the Ron Paul Institute and talked about the real reasons why the U.S. was occupying Afghanistan and how it did have a link to China, both with the Xinjiang region, uh, you know, supporting Uyghur separatists, um, to destabilize that part of China, which borders Afghanistan all the way to Pakistan and destabilizing China trade relations in the region and that country, and of course, the nuclear arsenal in Pakistan. But, you know, there is this question of Taiwan as well, which you have referenced many times. And at the Shangri-La Dialogue, uh, China's new defense minister, uh, Dong Jun, said that the separatists in Taiwan, Lai ching uh, uh, the new president representing them, has recently called Taiwan a nation in his inauguration speech. But the defense minister of China said that these separatists will be nailed to the pillar of shame in history and that the China's Chinese People's Liberation Army has been an indestructible and powerful force in defense of unification, and it will act resolutely and forcefully at all times to curb the independence of Taiwan and ensure it never succeeds in its attempts. So, Colonel Wilkerson, uh, maybe you can talk about this front of war here that's building with Taiwan, because I've covered many times, you know, the U.S. sending special forces to islands just off of the mainland coast, uh, the backlog of weapons. There's so much to talk about here, but perhaps uh, uh, you can go here where you want with it. Uh, I know that you have also war game the scenario uh, over this, and so I'm very interested in hearing how you think this would go for the United States, given the correlation of forces that you often reference? Going back to some of the war games, increasingly is, I think, uh, difficult to make applicable because things have changed so much. The general strategic tenor has not changed, though, except, again, we have a Biden mistake, a huge mistake, declaring, as I think he actually used the term, strategic clarity rather than strategic ambiguity. The latter being, of course, what we've been dealing with very successfully, both Beijing and Moscow, uh, or Beijing and Washington, um, since Nixon and Kissinger met with Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai. The strategic ambiguity being we recognize there's only one China, and China says, Okay, thank you very much. And we promise not to use force on Taiwan. Um, there's more to it than that, of course, but that's the gist of it. And then we passed the Taiwan Relations Act because the Republicans, largely neoconservative uh, birthplace uh, or part of it, um, decided that uh, they didn't like what Nixon and Kissinger did. They didn't like Kissinger in particular. Um, and so you know, we got a Taiwan Relations Act that said, okay, we recognize that that's what has been achieved in dialogue and that agreement we will adhere to, but boy, we're going to keep Taiwan ready. We're going to keep their airplanes up. We're going to keep their cannons up. We're going to keep their tanks up. We're going to make sure they're ready. Well, you could make sure they're ready all day long. It wouldn't make much difference. And one of the realities that has not changed, it's just grown dramatically worse, is that in Fujian province alone, the Chinese have enough armament, including ground forces, to swamp Taiwan in about 36 to 48 hours. I don't think the Chinese are going to do that. I hope they're not going to do that because Xi has been very careful in his words. I think he's deploying these military officers and sometimes Wang Yi, whom uh, I feel like I know fairly well. Richard Haas and I met with him in the summer of 2000 in Beijing. He was then, summer of 2001, he was then head of sort of the North American division in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. 
And we remarked when we finished the lunch with him the second day, I believe it was, we'd been meeting with Shui Tin Kai and then Wang Yi. We remarked out in the hallway, all of us on the policy planning staff of the State Department who were visiting remarked, that's a man to watch. And of course, what Wang Yi has done is what a few in the past, like Chen Chi Chen, have done. He's so competent, he's so good as a diplomat and as a bureaucratic entrepreneur, if you will, that they moved him to being a sort of plenipotentiary between the MOFA and the Politburo. The Chinese don't really like MOFA much in the sense of things, just like we don't like the State Department very much. These guys and gals deal in diplomacy. We like people who deal with power and, and bullets and bombs and such. Uh, so the Chinese are sort of that way too, but when they do move someone out of MOFA up to that position, and Wang Yi could well be a Politburo, uh, Politburo member someday if he wants to. Um, I wouldn't put that past the, the power structure, put him actually on the Politburo. But he's, a, he's an astute man, so I listen to him. I listen to him whenever he's speaking. Um, and along with Sergei Lavrov, who is now turned into sort of a venomous diplomat, I've never seen Sergey be quite this venomous, but I think he's sort of playing the, the, the really bad cop to Putin's somewhat bad cop. And so Putin's offering all these, even in English, when he chooses to speak in English, he's offering these um, let's get togethers and let's end this thing because we need to do that, but realize that I need to get what I invested in it out of it. Um, and while Sergei is getting increasingly rough in his rhetoric and strong in his rhetoric, and I, I suspect that that is sort of a good, good cop, bad cop routine, uh, but Sergei's probably one of the best diplomats in the world. I, I would put Wang Yi and Sergei up as the two top diplomats on the face of the globe right now. And I'd throw a couple of Indians in there too, and there's a, a, a tale. Watch where India goes in all this mess, because right now Modi has pretty much gotten his political dilemma solved, at least temporarily. He's going to have to give a lot of power to the opposition in forming a government. But he's back in charge for at least another term. And India and Turkey are the two countries to watch. I suspect Turkey will leave NATO and un unhinge its southern flank overnight because Turkey has the most powerful land army in NATO. Not the U.S., not Germany. Not Britain, certainly not Britain, that poodle dog. Turkey. Turkey has the most powerful land army in NATO. If they exit, not only have they uncovered the southern flank of NATO, a very vulnerable flank, but they have also said to the world, I'm either going neutral or I'm going to join the BRICS. And I would suspect the latter. So there you begin the unraveling of Europe and the transatlantic link and the alliance that I've been talking about is coming all along. Um, Turkey would be justified, I think, in saying to the EU, I've been courting you for years and years, decades I've been courting you, and you have turned me away every time. Now I am turning you away. See what you get. And, you know, that's the sort of thing that Erdogan might do, not only to do it from a strategic point of view, which would make sense for Turkey, um, but also to try and win back some of the political capital that he's lost now, as indicated by the most recent elections. So there's all sorts of potential for things to happen here. But back to the China issue, we have forced with our stupidity in Ukraine and our dogginess in hanging on to a lost situation almost a formal alliance to occur between Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping and China and Russia. So much so that I suspect right now that Xi Jinping is building out his nuclear complex, which he wants to do. Mao didn't have many weapons. Mao didn't think he needed many weapons. And China's had that doctrine for a long time. Now they've changed their mind. They're going to build out. They want to be able to ride out a first strike. They want to be able to retaliate after a first strike. That means they're going to go to five or 6,000 weapons to be the equivalent stockpile of the United States and Russia. So we forced that. And I think probably Putin may help him do that because Putin and the Japanese have probably the best plutonium stocks in the world. And if he wants to build out really fast, he needs plutonium-based warheads rather than uranium-based warheads. That's 
another story altogether, but that's how dangerous this is, what we've done. Not only that, China is offering Russia, who has now put an economic minister in its defense agency to manage its economy because now they're taking that banging on eight cylinders economy, which is was putting about five and a half to six percent of its very robust GDP into the war in Ukraine. They're now putting seven to eight and planning on possibly more of that GDP percentage into their industrial base for military munitions, airplanes, tanks, and such, in order to take NATO on when the bigger war comes, which they are now preparing to fight. So we've caused all this by our strategic imbecility. And you, you just there's an old principle of international relations. Fred Hartman put it at the front of his book, The Relations of Nations. It's called The Conservation of Enemies. And it's simply stated is no prudent state ever wants more enemies at one time than it can handle. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. <laughs> and look at what we're doing in Gaza. 3.6 billion people at last count now think because of Gaza in their face for the last two years, or roughly, they look, and Ukraine and Gaza, Ukraine for a couple of years, Gaza for since October the 7th, they now think that the greatest agent for chaos in the world, and thus the greatest threat to their future in the world, is the American empire. Poll after poll is now revealing that particularly amongst 40 year olds and younger. Even on the Korean Peninsula, an ally, we have young people who think the United States might be the worst threat that South Korea faces. Um, this is not a way to conduct your affairs in the world if you were supposed to be the quote, rules-based order, unquote, advocate. And the law advocate, the rule of law advocate. We're, we're simply, we're an agent of chaos not an agent of order. Um, and that might produce what you were talking about. Long answer, but come back to your question. That might produce an exchange of nuclear weapons.